Well, it was a lot of fun in Texas, and it was nice and warm in Texas, but I got to tell you, it's nice to come home and to be with the family here, and I just want you to know that we really do appreciate each and every one of you and, and the encouragement that you give us here as we work here, as we all work here together, and um, there's just nothing quite like home, and so we just thank you for that. And it's great news that Elena is baptized into Christ. And I remember the first time that we partook of the Lord's table after our baptism and, and the meaning it had. Before that, it was like, do we do this? Do we not? When we were visiting and whatever. But when we were part of the Lord and we partook took of the table the first time, that was so precious. And so I know what you're feeling today, too. You know, I was told that you can find good in everything. All you have to do is look for it. Sometimes you have to look really hard, but you can always find it if you're looking for it. And so as I was putting my sermon together this week, I was thinking about that, and I thought, yeah, there probably is something good in most everything. For instance, I think it's really good that I'm not a bug or an insect particularly a praying mantis. Because a praying mantis, when they mate, the female eats the male, bites his head off. and So I'm glad I'm not a bug. It's a good thing. <laughs> the black widow spider kills her mate. And both the females in these situations are bigger than the male. And the black widow does it more out of protecting the, the eggs that she's going to lay in the babies. And most scorpions do that kind of strange but they do that and then I got I was reading up and I realized that on a grasshopper they sometimes eat their mate after mating but most times the mate just goes off and dies and then the female after they lay the eggs die too and so I realized that this is like the cycle of life you know something is born it grows, it matures, it reproduces, it gets old, or sometimes it doesn't get old, it's just as it reproduces, it's done. <laughs> but, um, and you die. And that's true about bugs, that's true about animals, and it's true about you and I. And the only difference is, is how God created us different from the animals or the bugs or that kind of thing and the time period and all of that stuff. And some people have looked at this and they've pondered and they've asked some questions. They ask, what is the purpose of life then? Some will say, why is it that way in life? Why does it have to be that way? Well, I guess the short answer for you and I, it has to be that way because of sin. That would be the short answer. But I want to show you something this morning. John the Baptist was born just like you and I are born. His dad was Zechariah. His mother was Elizabeth. And they were old. They were up there in age when they had John the Baptist. In fact, Elizabeth thought it was kind of funny that God would even say she could have a baby. And then when she got pregnant... She wanted to hide it because it was embarrassing because of her age. And you think about that, and yet, Zechariah, the angel comes to Zechariah, and he says to Zechariah, your prayers have been answered. Now think about that. Zechariah was praying that they'd have a baby, even at that age. They didn't want to go to their grave without having a child. And his prayer is answered. And of course, from there on, there is rejoicing. And then the angel tells them that because of their son, many people will rejoice. And then she gets together later with Mary. And the baby leaps in her womb. Now, Dee Dee can kind of relate to that a little bit. She's 
got a baby in her womb, and she says the baby is kicking her and doing different things. I don't know if he's leaping or not. But it's that excitement, that, that joy of a new life. And then you think of there's a future for this life. And it's so exciting. But John the Baptist, like you and I, grew up. He got a little older. He started to mature. And when he came to maturity, he had a purpose in life. And that's what his ministry was all about. And he started to preach repentance for forgiveness. He started to turn the people's hearts back to God. It's hard for you and I to believe or to think that God's people at that time, their hearts weren't with Him. We look back, and I think we always look back through ideal glasses or something, and we look at them and we say, well, they were God's people, and they, you know, they were God's chosen, and, and they were this and they were that. No, they were His chosen people. He had chosen for a purpose and for a time, but their hearts weren't with Him. And that was true of Israel for a long time. And that's probably true of many Christians. They may be Christian in name, but their heart may not be with God. And so John had to turn their hearts back to God. And, and all of that was under the umbrella of preparing the way for the Lord, for the Messiah. The Messiah was coming. In fact, the Messiah was, we'll get into this in a minute, but was only six months behind in birth of John the Baptist. And so he's preparing the way. He's making the paths straight. He's telling the people, it's time to repent. The Messiah is coming. And John understood that that was what his life was about. Now, John struggled with it. John had moments where he said, is this really the Christ? Because it probably wasn't going exactly the way John the Baptist had it planned. But it was going exactly the way God had it planned. And so, John it does his ministry, and it's interesting. His disciples come to him in John chapter 3 and verses 22 to 30, and they say to him, Hey, John, John, we got, we got a serious problem here. That guy that you baptized over there in the Jordan, that guy, that Jesus, he's baptizing over there. And all the people are going to him. They saw that as a problem. And John said, oh, you guys don't understand. Let me explain it to you. It's not a problem that we have. He said, you know, we only have what is given to us from the Father. And what he's given isn't given to me. I was given something, and he was given something. And John says, so here's what's going on. My job's kind of done. I have to decrease. I'm fading out of the picture. And he has to increase. That's why all of this is going on. Because I only really came to prepare the way for him. And John, in, in preaching the gospel, got himself in trouble. And John probably wouldn't have planned it this way, but John couldn't help himself because it burned inside him. And he had to tell King Herod that he was wrong in trying to steal his brother's wife from him and marry her for himself. He said, that's wrong. And you need to repent of that. But it's funny, the rest of them didn't like that so much. All the people involved in that didn't like that. They didn't like John for that. And he gets thrown in prison. And then he's beheaded in prison because of the wish of one of the people that had an evil heart and was against John the Baptist. And so John was born, and you might say he was born to die 
Because that's really what happened. But it's important why he died. And that's what people sometimes miss. He was born to die for the kingdom. And so right after John the Baptist came along Jesus the Christ. He was born of a virgin. There were prophecies in Scripture about his birth, how it would happen, where it would happen, and why it would happen. The where was Bethlehem, the how was by a virgin, and the why was because we're sinners, and he wanted to redeem us from our sin. And so he's born. And, and Mary is excited. But can you imagine being the mother of Jesus? And all of these things going on after his birth. And you're, you're just taking it all in. And it says from time to time that she just pondered these things in her heart. You know, people were going on and they missed it. They, they totally missed what was going on around them. But she was going, oh, I got to remember this. I got to remember this. Wow, what? I got to remember this that happened too. There's got to be a point to all of this. And so as a mother, she was watching out for her son. The shepherds came, all of those things, and then there's big turmoil in his life. He had to move. Can you imagine being less than two years old and having to fl flee the country and, and live somewhere else as a stranger with your parents and then come back and, and all of the things that were going on. And that all happened just right around his birth. But then he grew up and he was 12 years old. And he was in the temple. And they said, what are you doing here? Why did you stay here? You were supposed to be walking with us home on the road. And he said, didn't you know that I have to be in my father's house? Now, if someone said that to you, what would you think? I mean, you knew what the temple was, right? It was God's temple. That was God's house to the Jews. And he said, I needed to be in my father's house. He's making a statement very clear. And, he, and it says that he grew, the child grew, and wisdom and, and, and knowledge and all of those things. And he grew and he practiced his ministry. He came into his ministry. Satan tried to take him out at the start of his ministry with the temptations. It didn't work. And Jesus did many miracles they would come to him and say, but we got to see a sign. I don't know how many signs they wanted to see, but they, he did a lot of signs. But they just said, we want to see another sign. But all through his ministry, Jesus had one thing in mind. Jesus was born to die. He had the cross in his view. His destiny, he knew, was death, physical death. But he also knew his destiny was spiritual life. But he knew he'd had to die physically. So his ministry, his life, was a march to the cross. Now think about that. In John chapter 11, 49 to 51... Caiaphas, the high priest, he gets up in front of the people there, his, his uh, cohorts there, and he says, you guys aren't thinking very straight. Think about this. Isn't it better for one to die for the people than all the people die? And John says, but I'm going to explain that to you, and he puts in brackets, he didn't realize what he was saying, but he was prophesying that Christ would die for the people, for mankind. You see, it was prophesied that he would die. In John chapter 3 and verse 14, Jesus said, you remember Moses? You guys hang on to Moses a lot, so you remember Moses? And he was out there in the wilderness and, and the people disobeyed God and God punished them and, and they got, they, there was these vipers that were biting them and so he told them, 
put a, a serpent on a, a bronze serpent on a pole and raise it up in the middle of the camp and whoever looks at that bronze serpent they'll be healed of the snake bite he said the son of man has to be lifted up just like that he was talking about his death he understood that that's where he was heading in John chapter 12 verses 27 to 33 he said that when he is lifted up when the son of man is lifted up he will draw all people to him that same idea of being lifted up and then in John chapter 10 he talks about him laying down his life for us laying down his life but he would pick it up again and then in, in Matthew chapter 12 when they came to him and they said, we want to see a sign. And he had done so many signs already. And he said, well, he said, there will be none other given to you than the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the earth. He knew it wasn't the end. But he knew that's what his destiny on earth here was. And so you could say he was born to die. And you say, so? So what? What has that got to do with me? Well, Jesus was born to die for the kingdom. And likewise, we are born to die. Whether you like it or not. You know, it's interesting, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul talks about the perishable body being planted and imperishable coming out of it, or immortality, the mortal body being, being planted in the ground and the Im body of immortality coming up out of it, or the physical body being planted and getting a spiritual body. He talks about that. And we don't, I don't think as Christians we think of that enough. But as Christians, as the saved, we are born again, or born anew, born from above, so that we can die for the kingdom. Think about this. Romans chapter 6 and verse 6. Paul is recounting to the church at Rome their, what they did when they were baptized into Christ. And in verse 6 he says, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. We are to die to our old self, our old man. Ephesians 4 and verse 22, Paul says that we have to put the old man off. That idea of we are dying to the old man so we can live for Christ. 1 Peter 2 and verse 24 and 25 tell us that we died to sin so that we no longer live in sin. We're supposed to live for Christ. So there is something that we are to die for when we're born. We are to die to the old man and put on the new. In fact, if you look in Colossians, that's the point Paul is making to them in chapter 3. In chapter 3, starting in verse 1, he says, If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things, that's born in Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passions, evil, account of these, the, or on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, and he goes on. We die, we are born in Christ to die to old, the old man. Unfortunately, that struggle sometimes 
is so hard that people don't succeed at it and they don't really die to the old man. But we need to die to the old man if we're going to walk with Christ. And as a Christian, we are called to die to ourself. That's even harder sometimes. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus said, you want to be my disciple? You want to know what it's going to take to follow me? I'll tell you what. Here's what it's going to take. You have to deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow me. It is a daily process of denying ourself for Christ. We have to die to self. In fact, the same principle Paul puts out in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3, where he says, uh, depending on your translation, you have to esteem others higher than yourself or think of others more significant than yourself. That's the same principle. Putting others before yourself. Denying self. Dying to self. And I know that's hard. It's difficult. When I really want something, it's hard for me to let someone else have it. But as you practice that, and that becomes your nature because you're in Christ, it's a blessing to be able to do that. But we are called to die to self. And we are also called to die for Christ's sake. You know, I've mentioned this before, but in our generation or several generations people don't want to die they don't want to accept death we're trying to cheat death at every turn that we can but death is a part of life it's a fact of life and so in Philippians chapter 1 verses 20 through 29 Paul talks about um, the suffering that he went through, starting in verse 20. And he says, um, As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet, which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. Paul says... I'm putting it all on the line for Christ. And if I die, that's okay. If I live, that's okay too. But I realize at some point, I will have to die for Christ. And he suffered and there were imprisonments and eventually he died for Christ. You could say he was born to die. Revelation 2.10 in Smyrna. They were in the heart of Satan. There, the church was at Smyrna. And he said, I am so proud of you guys because you're holding on to the faith in Christ. You are doing what is right. All I have, for you, all I have to say to you is I want to encourage you to keep persevering because there's going to be imprisonment. Some of you are going to die, but you'll have your reward. For me to die is gain. For me to live is Christ. That's what Paul said. It's all about living for the kingdom and dying for the kingdom. You know that principle, that concept, isn't that difficult to understand. We're born. We grow. We mature. We enjoy life. We like the life. We live our lives and we grow old. 
We can accept all of that to a point, and it's okay. But we also die. That is life. That's, that's part of it, even if we don't want to accept it. Paul says that Christians should not fear death. Jesus overcame death. He defeated death at his resurrection. And we shouldn't fear it. But oftentimes we do. But what we need to understand is death is part of the process. And if I'm speaking for Christ and God says, it's your time to come home. If somebody shoots me, takes my head off, I die of a heart attack, whatever it is, it's a reward to me. Because I'm going home. It's a good thing. But we don't look at it that way. Because the principle is easy enough to understand, but the practice is a little more difficult. You see, we have to deny self, but if we live for self, if we want things the way I think they should be, or I want things the way that I see they should be, or what I believe they should be, or what suits me, or the way I want it because I'm king of my life, I'm in trouble. I'm going to fear death because that's very short-sighted. But if I live my life for Christ, He's my Savior, He's my Lord, He's my Master, He sits on the throne of my life, I serve Him as King, I've got a much longer-term view. In fact, I've got an eternal view. So what is the purpose then of life? Why is it this way in life? Well, because of sin. This life is our training ground. It's our start on life eternal. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that in Christ Jesus we plant this mortal body as a seed and we will receive a body that is immortal. The physical planted for a spiritual. That is the purpose of this life. A birth, a death, and a resurrection to a new life. Of course, that is only good, that's only hopeful when we're immersed into Christ. If we're not in Christ, if you're here today and you're not in Christ, and you want to change that, we want to help you change that. We encourage you to change that situation. We encourage you to repent of your sin, to confess Christ as Lord. Be immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and be raised to walk with him anew in all eternity. We implore you to come while we stand and sing. Since the love of God is shed, Christ's blessings on my head I have made. I will hide it in my heart that it never may depart It shall rule there alone The love of God within the heart Will kindliness and warmth impart The soul will glow like Jesus in his tender mercy If the heart is made his dwelling place The love of God
glory till we see him face to face. While his love burns true and bright, we are walking in the light he has shown us the road. We his glory must reflect, lest our dimness and neglect keep from soul from its God, the love of God within the heart, the kindly man, the kindliness and warmth in heart, the soul will glow like Jesus in his tender mercy, if the heart is made his dwelling place, the love of God within the Years, it is the same. The love of God will never fail to use His glory till we see Him face to face.